Um, and my name is Patrick Laporte. I'm a director of product marketing for network automation. Uh, I was part of NFD 12 when we initially presented, and we're really looking forward today to showing you some of the new innovations and the new advancements we've made with our automation platform and our SLX uh, switching platform. Now, I've got some great demonstrations lined up. This is really all about doing demonstrations and allowing you guys to dig in to the technology, ask questions. I've got some great presenters who are going to come up and show the capabilities that we're talking about. Um, I think we've got some really cool things that we're going to show. Um, and so take the time, make sure you ask those questions. But before we get to a lot of that, I want to first spend just a few minutes talking about the new extreme. As Tom mentioned, we're under a little bit different colors. Um, and I want to go into that a little bit, introduce the new extreme, and then spend a little bit of time um, digging into the, the key considerations that we went through when we developed our automation platform and our switching platform. And then when we talk with customers, the key considerations that they need to take uh, into account when they think about how they're going to improve their operational agility and their efficiency using automation technologies and, and networking platforms. Okay? So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to cover is the new extreme. Now, um, the people that you're going to see today, including myself, uh, we are uh, ex-brocade SRA employees. SRA stands for Switching, Routing, and Analytics. This is the business unit that Extreme acquired back in December of 2017. And uh, I, I can speak for a lot of these guys, including myself. I got to tell you, we are incredibly excited about joining Extreme. And the primary reason for that is that the, the enthusiasm within Extreme is just incredibly tremendous, and we're really glad to be a part of it. And we're hoping to kind of funnel a lot of that enthusiasm into great innovations that allow organizations and customers to be able to achieve those business objectives. So let me just pop over here. Um, so let's talk about Extreme a little bit. Now, uh, with the acquisition of Brocade, and before that, the acquisition of Avaya and, and many other technologies and companies, Extreme's kind of been on this, this expansive, uh, explosive growth phase. And because of that, now we have not only a portfolio, but the operational footprint to be a legitimate player for enterprise opportunities, both large and small. From, an opera, uh, from a portfolio standpoint, with the acquisition of Brocade, now we have an end-to-end -end networking portfolio from data center core, across the campus edge with our Avaya technologies, and all the way out to the wireless edge. And, and because of that, now we can um, uh, purpose-built our technologies for each one of those segments. And so across the top, you have a, a very easy to use GUI-based management interface that today manages a lot of the infrastructure for the wireless side as well as the campus side. And then moving forward, now you're gonna see that same integration with our um, uh, data center products. And so from a management perspective, that's gonna make things a lot easier for our enterprise customers. Now from an operational standpoint, all these acquisitions add up to a tremendous operational footprint. We've got over 3,000 employees now operating in over 80 countries. Uh, we're supporting over 30,000 customers and driving roughly 1.2 billion in revenue. Now, all those numbers are great numbers and we're very proud of it. Um, and we think that that's gonna allow us to do great things. The number that we're really most proud of is our number one rating in service and support. Now, you may not know this, but Extreme is the only end-to-end -end networking vendor that has a completely 100% in-sourced support organization. Every single one of our support staff are extreme employees. And because of that, we're able to achieve a 94% first person resolution rating. So when our customers pick up the phone with a problem, the person that answers that call on the other side, 94% of the time, that's gonna be the same person that's gonna resolve that issue. And that has a tremendous impact on the quality of service and the customer satisfaction. So that's a number that we're incredibly proud of. So collectively, when you put together this portfolio of end-to-end -end networking capabilities and this operational footprint, it's, um, it's clear that we're now able to compete head-to-head -head with a lot of the other major uh, uh, competitors in this space. And actually, we're finding ourselves increasingly uh, on the short list for large-scale enterprise opportunities. And so we're really looking forward to, to uh, taking the fight to our competitors and winning more and more business. So any questions on the new extreme in a nutshell? Could you maybe uh, quickly just, just 
or what was brought from Brocade, mm. what's kept. Yeah. Because uh, I know Brocade was very involved in like the microtransactions in the stock exchange. Is that... Yeah, so the, the, the products that we brought over uh, were all part of the SRA business unit, which is the switching, routing, and analytics. So you get our VDX platform, you get our MLX platform, you get our new SLX platform, you get a lot of the automation tools, such as our Workflow Composer, StackStorm, um, uh, our Flow Optimizer, and then Analytics, so our, our Analytics products. Um, those are the products and the team, the engineers, product management, and product marketing that came to Extreme. So if you're thinking of some of the other products that Brocade had, such as vRouter or um, certainly the storage or campus products, those all went their separate ways into other, other companies. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, what we consider to be the key considerations that we used when we started thinking about how to uh, invest in innovations that uh, will help our customers achieve greater agility and efficiency, but also help our customers to understand those key considerations when they're thinking of investing in network infrastructure to solve these problems. So <clears throat> when you, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm, I'm still fighting off a little bit of a cold, so hopefully I, I won't lose my voice halfway through this. If I do, I'm going to have to ask one of you guys to get up here and talk. Um, so when we, took a, when we uh, talked with customers, when we considered what we were going to do, we had to look at what the current state of the industry was. What problems were our customers trying to solve? And it really boils down to doing things much faster and more efficiently. You know, if you think about it, all you guys work in tech, we work in tech. Um, everything is about doing things faster and more efficiently. And by collectively doing that, we're enabling the organizations that we work for to be faster and more efficient, and thereby enabling the businesses that support those, uh, that those organizations support to move much faster and more efficient. So it's all about being much more agile and being much more efficient. Now, if you think about it, um, within a data center, agility really can come from all sorts of of places. You got, for example, on the infrastructure side, you've seen improvements in agility there in terms of technology such as virtualization and containers that can provision service infrastructure services much faster. Um, up the scale, if you go up to orchestration, obviously that's had huge benefits in allowing the operation to move much more efficiently. <coughs> On the technology side, applications have seen huge improvements in agility. Tools <laughs> like Puppet and Chef have enabled the velocity of, of application provisioning and updates to accelerate. Now, on the other side of the coin are the cultural elements, the things like the people and the process and the policies. Now, even there, there's been tremendous improvements in agility. Methodologies like CICD and DevOps have allowed these organizations to embrace new processes and integrate with each other to increase the velocity of delivering services to their users and their customers. <coughs> Sorry. And then in between all of that, you have all the kind of middleware services, the, the workflows, the services, and, and all the elements that kind of stitch all these capabilities together. In each and every case, you've seen minor improvements in agility and efficiency. But the thing is, is that Within each one of these domains, improvements in agility, while good, has not had a necessarily material impact on the business and the ability for the entire organization to move faster and more efficiently. And part of that is, if you think about it, agility, you're only as agile as your least agile component. And today, it, depending on how you want to look at it, it's a good thing or a bad thing. Today, that choke point is really around network operations and network provisioning and network management. So when we think about automation, we want to think about automation in two forms. Automation that can automate the entire life cycle of networking beyond just provisioning, but also handle troubleshooting and remediation, mm -hmm. but also then enable network automation to connect to automation that exists in other domains, cross domains. So connect with technologies like Puppet and Chef, connect with monitoring tools, connect with OSS and BSS type systems. And by connecting those pieces together, automating the entire life cycle, but then also connecting that automation with other elements, you're eliminating a lot of that cross domain latency that exists when organizations try and deploy new services. And essentially, 
you deliver greater operational agility and efficiency for the entire organization. So network automation is a key element in achieving those goals. But it's not the only piece. There's still one piece that's missing. When you think about automation, automation's only as good as the engineer that, that put it together. The knowledge that they had at the time, they put into the code and they execute that, that uh, code. Now, in, in, for, in, for, in order for automation to um, work efficiently, it has to have information. It has to have the best information it has at the time to be more effective. Now, I just talked about automation that can automate the life cycle of networking. For example, provisioning, troubleshooting, remediation, that's good. And then automation that connect with cross-domain technologies, that's even better. But automation that can do all that <coughs> and has pervasive visibility across the entire data center and within the network is best. And so, what we're saying here is that when you think about automation and you think about um, visibility, they go hand in hand. And by putting those two together, you're having a greater impact on the operational agility and efficiency of your entire organization. So when you think about visibility, it's a lot like agility in that it comes from all the different elements of the data center. For example, visibility into the culture, cultural visibility, having the ability to take the unique processes and policies and capabilities that exist within every data center and are unique within each data center and be able to roll that into your automation is going to make that automation much more effective. But from a network automation standpoint, and here we are at network field day, so I want to make sure we focus on that. Oh, and we're a network vendor, so I want to make sure we focus on that. From a network perspective, pervasive visibility deep into the infrastructure in real time, the ability to extract information from wire to workload and be able to feed that back into your automation is now going to make the cycle work much more effectively. And then when you add all those pieces together, you're having now a legitimate material impact on the agility and the efficiency of the organization. Any questions? Any disputes? <laughs> Okay. Let's see it. Okay. Yes, I know. I want to hurry up and get to the demos. We're, we're I know. pretty familiar with network automation. I think it's you know becoming very pervasive in the industry. So yeah, we laid the groundwork. You know. Yeah. I'd like to see how it works. Cool. Okay. So let's uh, let's get to network automation. So when we were here last, we were talking about Stackstorm and Workflow Composer. We had just acquired uh, Stackstorm, the company, shortly before we did Network Field Day 12. And uh, when we joined and presented to you guys, we hadn't had time to really incorporate Stackstorm into uh, Brocade's portfolio and then also make it work with our brand new switching, plat switching and routing platform called the SLX. Well, we've done a bunch since then, but I want to do a quick refresher on um, our automation platform because it is, I think, one of the most powerful platforms out there. So just so you know, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the automation platform that we use is based on the Stackstorm open source project. Now, we own both Stackstorm um, as well as Workflow Composer. And Stackstorm, we, complete, we keep completely separate. We want it to be community-based. We want to uh, foster that community, grow the innovations, because Stackstorm provides us that event-driven cross-domain automation platform. In fact, if you go online and you look at exchange.stackstorm.com, <coughs> you'll see roughly <coughs> 2,000 integration packs that have been developed by the community to integrate Stackstorm with whatever technologies that particular customer needs. And then they post these up and they're available for anybody else to download. Completely open source. Uh, you'll find Tesla in there, uh, for example. Why? I'm not really sure, but someone was bored. Uh, but you'll find technologies across a ton of other domains. <coughs> Um, now, Workflow Composer sits on top of Stackstorm and provides that enterprise-grade capabilities, such as improved security, um, global technical support, um, and we even include, and you'll see in one of the demos, a kind of trick, nice little uh, GUI for defining your workflows. Um, and so that's Workflow Composer. Now, when I talked earlier about uh, automation, there were two key characteristics, cross-domain automation and lifecycle automation. So let me just take a second to talk about cross-domain automation, because that's what comes with the Stackstorm platform. Now, the power of the platform is really in its simplicity. There's really only three primary components. There's sensors and actions, and then there's a rules engine that sits in between. Now, sensors are simply points of integration that integrate with various technologies and IT domains and so forth, using APIs or whatever is available. 
And all they, sit, all they do is simply sit there and listen for an event. Actions, on the other hand, are the opposite of, of sensors. They are points of integration which actually take action on whatever they're integrating with. And so between those two is the rules engine. Now, as a sensor detects an event, it sends that message up to the rules engine. And if that rule matches a rule that's defined by uh, the user, it will execute a series of workflows which then take action. And so the loop is really quite simple. When you develop a sensor and integrate it with a particular platform, when it detects an event, it sends a rule. That rule matches if this, then that. And based on that, it executes some workflows, which then may take action on one or more other technologies, and the, the cycle continues. And the sensors oh, are, I mean, I can see the logo, Ansible, and Puppet. That's what you... Yeah, yeah. It's, these are just a couple <laughs> examples. There's, okay. there's a, a boatload up there. And obviously, um, you know, we, we also use it for our extreme networking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, it's interesting because StackStorm, because it's an open source project, and it's just, it doesn't necessarily do networking. It's event-driven cross-domain automation. So customers like uh, Target uses StackStorm to uh, take all their disparate scripts and tools, combine it with their enterprise applications, and use that to mitigate their security situation <coughs> whenever their vendors or their partners are plugging technology into their infrastructure. So when these events happen, whether they're just new plugins or they're updates, there's a process where StackStorm will kick off a series of analysis, a series of checks to make sure that everything is still within uh, the confines of, of the certain policies. And so that allows them to maintain a security posture in a consistent way and in an automated way uh, using this event-driven platform. Now, another customer uh, that's frequent user of StackStorm is Netflix. And all they've done is simply automate their runbooks. So they used to maintain these, these hard copy runbooks. And they showed us a picture one time. It was like this thick. Um, now all that automation is put into StackStorm. And whenever something uh, gets changed, gets updated, they want to tweak their runbook a little bit, they don't do the doc anymore. They just put it into the automation. Um, and it's interesting, I can't remember if it was Netflix or if it was LinkedIn um, was talking, one of the engineers, the SRE engineers that was talking to us about StackStorm and he said, look, this platform turns my 2 a.m. calls into 10 a.m. follow-ups. And the point there is that when that issue comes up at 2 o'clock in the morning, he's not getting paged because the event was detected, some remediation process was performed, and if that remediation was successful, no sense paging him. Instead, it's typically updating in a ticket, and that ticket is then reviewed when he comes in later in the day. And these are some of the things that we're going to demonstrate for you uh, going forward. So any questions on StackStorm or Workflow Composer? I know you guys just want to get to the demos. Okay, <laughs> one, I think one last slide. Um, okay, so the other side of automation that I talked about was lifecycle automation. And so when we started talking with customers about network automation, we showed them how you know, uh, Workflow Composer could provision an IP fabric really fast and it was all good and it was rainbows and unicorns. But at the end of the day, they said, look, that's great, but I only spend about 5% of my day provisioning stuff. Mm -hmm. The rest of my day is spent break fix. I get an alert, I, something broke down, I have to troubleshoot it, I have to collect information, and then I got to fix it. And so we started looking at how can we address the other 75, 80% of their day. And so with what we're going to show, show today, uh, we're going to focus very much on the aspects of troubleshoot, monitoring, troubleshooting, and remediation. Uh, because that's where everybody is spending the majority of their day. And if we think about how we can help an organization improve their quality of life and improve their agility and efficiency and better support the organization, finding ways to automate the other three sides of this uh, uh, life cycle, the monitoring, provision, or monitoring, troubleshooting, and remediation, we think will have a very significant impact uh, for our customers. So what we're going to see today, in fact, I think that goes next. So Let's go ahead and get started with the demos. Now, the theme that we're going to use here is a day in the life of a network operator. And as I mentioned, you know, network operators, they only spend about 5% of their time provisioning infrastructure, and then the rest of the time, it's all about troubleshooting and remediation. So we've got five demos uh, that we want to show you. Um, the first one is the only one that really does provisioning. Now, in this case, it does provisioning, but it also integrates with some cross-domain technologies. 
Uh, because again, when you think about a workflow that somebody does manually today, if we can automate that, even if it includes pulling information and pushing information from all these other sources, that's going to be a powerful tool for our customers. <coughs> so the first demo is about automated tenant provisioning. The second demo is going to take um, our automation platform and be able to detect, troubleshoot, and remediate a network service outage. And in that case, it's going to integrate with a monitoring tool, and I think we're using Splunk, and it's going to be able to perform a number of steps to try and fix that issue, and then um, update, uh, uh, I think, update Jira, update Jira and post messages to Slack. So uh, be ready for that one. The third one automated uh, detection and remediation of a DDoS attack. Now this one's combining Workflow Composer with our Flow Optimizer on our SLX switching platform to, to perform this operation. Then we're gonna take a little bit of a break from a demo and we're gonna uh, refresh your memories on Insight Architecture. Um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time describing how this unique capability um, is incredibly powerful and how it can help our customers to reduce mean time to recovery, mean time to innocence, um, uh, working with our automation platform and other third-party tools. And then um, the last two demos are very similar. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> We're going to show you how the Insight architecture can be combined with products such as CloudShark to do distributed packet capture or uh, Surf Ponar, Perf Sonar uh, to be able to do distributed performance monitoring. Um, so that's kind of the show. Uh, it's been about 15 minutes teeing everything up. Those are the demos that we're going to go through. Again, I encourage you uh, to take some time, ask questions, drill into details, and we hope um, that you like what you see.